Hi, welcome to the show. Today my guest is a Linfield professor, a professor of physics. He's also developed several processes and he has started a company, Aptech. The founder and the professor of physics with me today is Bill Mackey. Hi. Nice, nice to meet, meet you, Bill. See you, Bill. I met you at um, oh, no. Chamber of Commerce. That's right, several and times. I think you took a tour of Aptech once. Yeah, yeah. So, um, having a physics degree myself, I've been uh, just really looking forward to talking about what you do over there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back. Maybe just start with yourself. You uh, came into the community. I, actually, I came in here <laughs> way back in '67 to go to Linfield College, uh, majored in physics. At that time, and um, you know, there was a lot going on. I, I think I mentioned that I came here with my my dad. He was an uh, electrical engineer for a talk that Lynn Swanson gave on electron emission back in probably the mid '60s, and so that that acquainted me with Linfield College, and I ended up coming here. So electron emission, we're going to talk a lot about that today. Okay, but let's right. just back up a little bit. So you came and heard a talk by Lynn Swanson. Now, Lynn Swanson um, is a big name in, in um, electron emission. That's right. He founded the FEI company, uh, which is now Thermal Fisher Company. It got recently purchased. Uh, and he developed uh, basically the Schottky source, electron source, new source that's basically used throughout the world for electron microscopes primarily. So you got um, you got inspired by one of the greats at a lecture here at Linfield. That's right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you came and you, you you came to get a degree in physics. Yes. And where, what happened from there? Well, if I can, I back up just slightly. Oh, sure. Uh, talk about Linfield Research Institute. That's I worked there for many years, and I, I I'm rather proud of Linfield Research Institute. Research arm of the college. It was formed by Walt Dyke. In 1955, Walt Dyke was a member of the physics faculty, uh, and and at, at one point in the in shortly thereafter, 56, 7, there were up to 50 people working at Linfield Research Institute on electron emission devices. In 1958, he formed Field Emission Corporation, so that was the first spin-off company from Linfield Research Institute (LRI). Um, Femcor grew in town. People might remember some of the history of Field Emission Corporation. It was later purchased by Hewlett Packard, and uh, hence the college acquired that property later on. Um, but in the early 70s, well, I, probably 69 or 70, uh, Lynn Swanson, um, who was working at Femcor, moved to the college. Linfield Research Institute and became professor there and actually was dean for a short while. During that time and in 1971, he and two other people spun off a second company from Linfield. Uh, that was Field uh, FEI Company. That's gone on to grow big time and they're world leader in electron sources and electron microscopes. And I came there in the 60s, but then went off and did other things and came back in, um, the, in the 80s and started some research. And in 95, I, I spun off a company, Applied Physics Technology. So Linfield Research Institute through the years has been a, a good source of uh, inspiration for a lot of people, a lot of work on, for students, and spun off three successful companies. Wow. Okay. And uh, Aptech. Aptech is um, right out here in the industrial park. Yeah, on off of Riverside. Yes. Well, um, Paul, can we bring up that first slide? This is um, the pictures of some of the students that. Uh, oh yes, this is back in I think '98. Uh, this was a group of students. Um, students working for me. I'm on the right there. Uh, Gary Cabe is in the back on the left. He's founded. Uh, Applied physics with me in '95, um, and then there's a, f a few other researchers, and most all of them are students. Okay, and then uh, the next slide, Paul. This is the crew at Aptech. This was from about a year ago. A couple of faces have changed, but but uh, we have quite a crew now. I think we have 22 people uh, working for us on various phases of electron 
product development and manufacture. All right. What's next? Oh, this just shows some of the facilities that applied physics. Um, that is the zone refining room. So, uh, little history. Electro what are electron sources? Well, they, they're materials. They're special materials that give up electrons easily. So it's the, it's the function of the material. And the crystal orientation it needs, to be a it needs to be pure and a single crystal. So this, these facilities here are what are called our zone refiners. They grow single crystals of various materials that they, we then shape into cathodes or electron sources. And those, um, those processes of growing those crystals, those are things that you've been instrumental in developing. That's uh, yes, it's not altogether new, but yes, those, those refiners we perfected because they were, made them better. All right, Paul, what's next? <clears throat> this is uh, another view of the interior of our production facilities and the clean room. At, uh, we have on the right there some uh, test equipment. We do a lot of product development some basic research, but mostly product development. And we have a clean room, uh, which we do mo a lot of our assembly in, which I and think is on the next slide. Those large um, containers there, those are, is that for vacuum? Yes, yes. So you pull all, what kind of vacuum there? They're, they're ultra high vacuum systems, yeah. We, all electron beam devices have to operate in vacuum. Or they they'd catch just, on fire if there was oxygen? Well, the electrons don't go very far in there. Okay. They just go millimeters. All right, so it's to not impede the electron. Yes, it's to not impede the electron. Now, I've noticed it, that um, on your, I recommend the website, the Aptex website, to, yeah. learn, to learn more about these, but I noticed that these will operate in a low vacuum. True, yes. Uh, we've developed some cathodes um, that will operate in moderate vacuums, but they have to be... <laughs> You know, it has to be evacuated to some degree. And these are measured in atmospheres of vacuum? Or how do you measure uh, We measure in, in, in millimeters of mercury, actually. Okay. It's like a barometer is like atmospheric pressure is 29 inches. Right. Or 760 millimeters. We're down into sub-millimeter ranges, so the very, very low pressures. Uh, even these um, ones that require less vacuum are still down in... They're still down into the sub-millimeter okay. range, yes. Okay, all right. Um, all right, what's the next slide, Paul? <clears throat> yeah, this is a clean room assembly. Actually, uh, she's assembling uh, a cathode, a borite cathode. We make two types of uh, borite, lanthanum hexaboride. It's a rare earth material, and cerium hexaboride, another rare earth material. Uh, both these materials have a, pr a property that they give up electrons easily when they're heated. So these make thermal sources, and she's, we, we grow the crystals, and then we shape them with uh, diamond wheels and various tools, and they're cleaned, and then she's mounting them in little uh, holders, basically, cat to, to form the cathode. Now, I read that um, you have um, really high level of purity in your crystals, 30 parts per million by weight of impurity. Yes, that's right. And now, is a clean room to keep that uh, purity, or that's something else? That's something else. The zone refining process purifies a crystal and makes it a, turns it into a single crystal. Mm -hmm. The clean room is just, if, if we had a speck of dust on there, mm -hmm. uh, that would... If a speck of dust were to get into the workings of an electron microscope, say the mm -hmm. apertures, mm -hmm. it would it would ruin the image. Okay. So the cleanliness is to keep any dust particles or any particles of any sort out of the system. So these these packaged cathodes are very clean. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about. Well, oh, here's a close up of. Yeah, I'll, just a. Photo of a, a cathode assembly. We, we're starting to make larger assemblies, but the largest is fairly small. Uh -huh. So all of our products are are pretty microscopic. This is an electron source in a, a little extractor assembly. All right. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about so an electron source. You've mentioned um, uh, electron microscopes. Yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. Would one of these go on an electron microscope? Yes, it could. It can go on all kinds of things. It's interesting. So the first question that I get asked mm -hmm. is, what do you use an electron source for? Mm -hmm. Well, 
Historically, they're used for imaging, so electron microscope, scanning electron microscopes, SEMs. Um, there are various sorts. They're made by a, a dozen companies throughout the world, and there are tens of thousands of electron microscopes throughout the world use, being used basically 24-7. They're also used for lithography. Lithography is used for making integrated circuits. So all chips, all computer chips, cell phone chips, all chips are, uh, that are made use electron beams to make the masks to write the integrated circuit. Electron beam in, in um, chip making is also used for analysis to see if the chip got made correctly, for imaging and for uh, measuring and uh, even doing chemical analysis. So electron beams are used for imaging, chemical analysis, uh, but other things too. Uh, X-ray sources. Anytime you have an X-ray source, it, the X-ray came from an electron beam. And so you don't. Um, there's no X-rays in the electron beam. No. So the electron beam hits a target. It has to hit a target. Uh, it can be a s simple electron source, as simple as a filament, for something like a dental X-ray, uh, or more sophisticated for 3D imaging X-ray systems. Any a target like tungsten. Tungsten. Uh, yeah. Some very heavy metal like tungsten. And out come x-rays. And, and they go through your bone and they land on a on, on a, a photographic plate. Exactly. Okay. Give us a, just a brief tutorial on a on an electron microscope. You got an electron beam, then what happens? So it is uh, focused, uh, electron beam focused and deflected, and so it can scan over the surface of a material. Mm. And at each spot, imagine this is doing it in spots. So okay. One spot, electrons hit, splash off electrons, those electrons are detected. So you either have a bright or dark spot at that one little point mm -hmm. based on the features and the composition of the material. Mm -hmm. Moves on to the next spot, splashes off, light or dark. It keeps doing that spot by spot, row by row, but it does it very, very fast. So and what it scans it at like TV images, speeds across, but it's doing it pixel by pixel. And every time an electron beam hits a spot, it splashes, gives you contrast. Uh, and so you basically can see what that surface is made of, both in terms of um, features, feature sizes, and uh, even chemical composition. Now, to magnify, that beam is scanning over a few millimeters square, which mm -hmm. is large for an electron microscope. Mm -hmm. But it can scan over smaller and smaller regions but yet the image is the same size on the screen. So mm -hmm. basically you're magnifying an image. So you can start with a, a millimeter square image and go down to you know, a few nanometer square image, which is... And what's collecting this information of the electrons bouncing off the target? So the electrons are bounced off and, and are collected and basically form a current, a little okay. electron current based on how many electrons are reflected off that one spot. Okay, and that data is all collated into an image? The data is all collated and then made into an image, yes. Okay, well, thanks for that. I mean, just to get an idea of <clears throat> electron sources, um, it, the old, our old televisions would have an electron beam that would yeah, scan. The, the old television screens or computer screens had an electron beam that scanned mm -hmm. the phosphor mm -hmm. on the front of the glass screen. Now they use flat panel mm -hmm. displays. It's still electrons or... Uh, are used in, internally, but it's a solid state device now. Now these beams that do lithography, printing the circuits of uh, transistors and computers and you mm -hmm. know, just unbelievably small spaces, these are very fine lines. Very fine lines. What are they down to now? So, tens of nanometers. Uh -huh. Very small. A nanometer is a, 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 mil, a billionth of a millimeter. A meter, yeah. A meter, so it's 10 uh -huh. to the minus nine. So your beams have to be f small, fine? So the beams have to be equally or? small, right, and to resolve detail in that scale. You, can't, you cannot see that optically at all. It's beyond the scope of being able to see optically. <laughs> oh. Basically, light wavelengths are too large to image that small material. It's way smaller than a wavelength of light. Oh so you gosh. need to use an electron source yeah. where the wavelength of an electron is extremely small. 
So if you're doing lithography and you're writing, you use a little higher power beam. If you're imaging, you don't want to melt the thing, so you just a lower power to yes. be able to see yeah, what you, you do down there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I might add there's new uses for electron sources all the time. One of the new uses we developed a source for was a company in Sweden. Everybody knows uh, 3D printing, what's called additive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Some people even have 3D printers at home that print objects out of plastic. They put down layers of powder and they use a, a laser to melt the powder in, into a 3D image. Well, this company wanted to make uh, high-temperature uh, metal alloys to, to make such things as titanium alloy for turbine blades or jet engine blades and whatnot. So to do that, they, they could not use a laser. It just was not powerful enough to melt these high-temperature metals. So they, they went to an electron beam, and we developed an electron source for them. And now they're turning out these... Um, these uh, 3D printers for commercial use in making all sorts of high temperature alloy devices. So like a, a, a turbine blade spins really, very fast, very needs fast. very fine um, tolerances. Very fine tolerances. So I mean, you, you know, <clears throat> normally if you're gonna make an object, you tar it with a block of the material and machine it all away. Well, this you can just basically 3D print it and, and only do the f surface finish afterwards. So it's quite so, remarkable. So, you build up the edge of each of these fan blades. Yeah, so Is if that... you imagine on a, on a flat surface, you mm -hmm. put down a, a layer of powder. Yeah. And then use an electron beam that you can move around the surface and melt various parts of it together. Mm -hmm. And then you put another thin layer, and you do the same. You melt it together. It, it melts to the underlying layer in the spots that you're melting, and the rest is just powder. It hasn't melted. So and you keep doing this layer upon layer upon layer and melting it, and you can form images, 3D images and curved shapes or anything you want. So if it was like a propeller, for example, you'd just be building up the edge of each of the, yep. the succeeding blades of layers. the prop, and you'd twist it, and underneath would be this, this um, prop would be growing, yes. and you'd be building on it. Yeah, Fantastic. and then when, when you're finished, basically you can lift the part out. The rest of it is just the dry powder that, that has not been melted, and it just falls away, and you end up Use with the next this time. 3D part. Yeah. And is this thing smooth? Or does it need to be polished up? It, how, how it, it, it needs some surface finish. Most, mm -hmm. most of it needs surface finish, but, but at least you didn't have to start and mill away a, oh. a huge solid block yeah. of the thing. And so what kind of cathode uh, ray source would, you, would we buy from you? It's one of the boride sources. Okay. Lanthanum hexaboride. And um, your, <clears throat> th these come off at a re relatively low working voltage, electron, yeah, electron volts. Yeah, so that, that's... But you accelerate them? Yes, they're accelerated to uh, fairly high energy. So they have, and, and, and the sources that we use for that particular application are a little physically larger. They can be a millimeter, the emitting area. These smaller electron sources I have here emitting sizes uh, even down to the size of a human hair uh -huh. on the very end. But these, the ones for the 3D printing are large. They're millimeter sizes. Now, I've gotten from you, Bill, that you're pretty, um, I don't know, you do some incredible stuff out there. Um, you yourself have developed the processes to make one of these, one of the, um, the CBIX processes, the only place in the world that these are made. The CBIX, that's correct. Yeah, we have a, uh, that's trademark. We're the only ones in the world that make that. Um, there's one other company in actually Japan, uh, Denka, that makes Lab6. That's our only major competitor. Actually. So um, this is world-class stuff that happens right in our, in our backyard. Yeah, we sell, well, most everything out of state and, uh -huh. and a lot out of country, but we, do, we sell a lot in, in... And this all started from a guy hearing a lecture about... Uh, started. how That's electrons right. are accelerated yeah. Yeah. by um, by Lynn Swanson. Yeah. So NASA came to you. Yeah, so we're a manufacturing company. We make electron sources, and, and most of our research is product development, as I mentioned. But we do have one government contract, and it's with NASA, and it's to work and develop an electron microscope suitable for Mars so that we can someday hopefully put an electron microscope on Mars. The problem there is, and I've learned a lot. The problem by, with Mars? <laughs> well, well, the problem with Mars is, 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 is getting there. 
we've never gotten anything back from Mars. So uh-huh. uh, getting there, um, it would be nice to bring some rocks back, and yeah. like they did moon rocks, so we can further analyze them. Mm-hmm. We have to send all the equipment there to analyze. Mm-hmm. Uh, why an electron microscope on Mars? Well, I, I learned a lot. We're, we're working with people at JPL and Marshall Space Flight Center on on the development and, and trying to provide what they want in an electron microscope. Um, but by looking at the, the minerals, the basically the dirt, the earth on Mars, they can look at grain size and chemical composition of these minerals and they can tell a lot about past history, how the how the Mars was formed, how if there was water on Mars, and if so, how it flowed and the volume of water and all sorts of things just by looking at particle sizes, distribution of particle sizes, and the chemical composition of the particles. Pretty amazing. Let's go to the couple. We've got two more slides that they're going to talk about some of the projects that you're working on. Paul, have you got um, another one there? Here we yeah, go. So, uh, applications. So yeah, we this this shows you the 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 image on the lower right is the three D printer. The mm. um, but the the and biggest, what is it? What is it? Material is it printing with 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 uh, titanium or probably? Okay. Yeah, they can wow. do most uh, most metals. They could they could print, but most the highest call is for titanium alloys. Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Electron microscopes, SEMs, are, are a big use. Transmission electron microscopes, they can image down to atom sizes. Um, um, lithography systems and uh, elemental analysis systems, chip making, and 3D printing or additive manufacturing, those are some of the big uh, uses of our cathodes. So worldwide. elemental analysis, you touched on that in this microscope, uh, this device that's going to Mars. We'll also have that capability. Of yes. you, you, you shoot an electron beam at some uh, particle. Yeah, so the uh, rock sample, say, is made uh-huh. up of minerals and the little crystallites of these various minerals. And so as the beam is scanning across, the beam hits, stimulates the atoms, and they give off a signature X-ray. And there's another detector which detects that and can tell what element that signal's coming from. So basically, along with getting an image from this electron beam, you also can get elemental analysis information. So you can basically map out elements distribution. From past knowledge, they know if you have various elements, they can tell what mineral, what rock formation that is, and so forth. So they haven't had an electron microscope on Mars yet? No. This is the first one? First one. And um, so we're going to see images that come from uh, your beam. Well, that would be nice. We'll and see. What, what year? Hope it works. I think the 2020 mission's already spoken for, so it would be after that, 2022 or 2024. Okay. Um, wow. That's they, and they just saw you in the phone book. <laughs> well, You're just known worldwide already. We had we had a prior project. One it was this was very small to to look at a, a, a electron microscope on the moon, and then. They thought well, putting one on the International Space Station. Uh-huh. So we sort of had a little in, but this this was a much bigger project, yeah. and this was this is what the 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 main emphasis and the main emphasis still with NASA is Mars. And is it, it have they given you a weight budget and a power budget? And, oh yes, yeah. And you gave De- them a cost def- budget? Def- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were way over budget, but that's oh. another story. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yes, they do. want it very robust because liftoff has tremendous forces and landing yeah landing they drop it they basically drop it and uh, it has to <laughs> in a balloon it has to withstand that so uh we did some vibration tests on, on our cathodes and so forth and also mars mars atmosphere is very low pressure it's sort of a vacuum but it's mostly carbon dioxide so okay. the cathode has to work in residual carbon dioxide as it turns out the schottky source will not will not work so our boride sources will. So we're using uh, one of these boride sources as the emitter in this special electron microscope, which is small. Basically, it is about a little over an inch in diameter and maybe eight or ten inches long. In a tube. In a tube. And uh, at one end, you put some dirt. And, at uh, one end, you put <laughs> some dirt, very close. 
within about two millimeters, and you can get an image. All right, 2022. We're gonna we're gonna be looking for those images. Yeah, I hope yeah. they. Yeah. yeah that, what what a lot of hopes and dreams. Everybody that's involved in those launches, you're gonna be watching this launch uh, definitely with a whole other yeah. layer of interest, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, we got, I think we've got one more slide on um, uh, some of oh, your projects. Projects that are, we're working on now, yeah. So uh, we're doing some further development work. The Phenom is a tabletop SCM. Most electron microscopes are huge. They're larger than, than uh, large office desk size. Tell us again uh, what SEM stands for. Uh, scanning. Uh, scanning electron microscope. Okay. A tabletop SEM, there's a picture of one there. It just has a... A uh, flat panel video screen and this thing that kind of looks like a espresso machine. Yeah, you, you can just put the sample in there. It has to be a small sample, but you can get uh, nanometer resolution images. So we probably don't have appreciation for this, but maybe these things used to fill most of the oh yes. of, a, of a room. Oh, most of the room. They take dip, power, two twenty. Uh, water, <laughs> uh, cooling water, uh, dry nitrogen, compressed air. And this thing, it just you just have a mouse and a screen, and that's it. It's just like and a little, it's, little bitty, looks like a fish tank pump sits on the floor. And um, now you, you pay what part in this? You have well, we the, make the the cathodes, electron source, and the whole housing that it, it's all aligned, pre-aligned, and it drops into the uh -huh. device. But we're making new sources now. We're working on a couple of next generation sources for them. So they came to you to develop for this, this they tabletop. Did. Yes. And what was new about what they asked you to do from the larger machines? Well, well small, the size, so the power was small, it was lower and, and... Smaller than this? Uh, it, actually, they're this size. It okay. turns out the cathode is... So, but lower simpler, power. But, but lower power and uh, they wanted longevity and they wanted an assembly that was easily aligned by us that then would drop in as field serviceable. Uh -huh. So it wouldn't take some highly skilled technician to change the source out. Alignment is a big deal. Alignment is a big deal. And if you bump yes. it or you put your coffee cup down on it, no. if it's yeah, not well, well built. If, 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 if we build it aligned, it, 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 we, we make it so coffee cups won't, yeah, yeah. won't hurt it. But, but to take one out and put a new one in, yeah. it's got to lock in. It has to lock in and with, be in, it sounds precise like within down nano. to less than a human hair width yeah. in sizes. Okay. All right, let's go back to that slide, Paul. What's next? Uh, tabletop uh, yeah. electron microscopes are a big deal. All right. Big deals. We're, we're looking at, well, we have um, the last one. This is, of course, the ESEM. That's the environmental SEM on Mars. Environmental, ah. what does that mean? Most electron microscope SEM use a fairly decent vacuum for the sample. Environmental SEMs can use basically not quite atmosphere, but close to it. They can be even wet samples on Earth. And in Mars, they want to be just Martian atmosphere samples. Mm. Uh, so an environmental SEM means an, an SEM that you can operate in the, in the residual environment that it's placed in. Because you don't want to have to put this material inside a vacuum. No. You've got to be able to go through the atmosphere that's on Mars yes. right to the dirt without... Yes. In fact, they have debated how they want this microscope to work. Do they want a column that they can just robotically arm control and put over the surface of a rock mm. and image right there. And move your your microscope around. And move your, or do they want to be able to take and break off a little piece and bring it into the microscope? That's They're still debating that. I think they've decided to bring the sample in. For more control. For a little more control, but still, it's, uh, yeah, it's an environmental SEM. So, yeah, we're, we're doing all sorts of work on... Lithography, new uses, uh, added to manufacturing, X-ray and X-ray sources, uh, custom, um, unique uh, X-ray sources is probably the, our newest lines of work. But there's also all sorts of uses for electron beams, S sterilization of all sorts of things. I mean, uh, we were working on a project in on with a company in Boston for a long while on. Uh, energy drinks or any kind of uh, drink you put in a plastic. They make the plastic and then they basically have to wash it before they fill it. Mm. They, want any, they want it pure, right? Yeah. Well, how do you wash it? Well, you wash it with soap and water and rinse it out, but then you got all this soapy water and rinse water. It's just waste. However, 
they just want to make sure, I mean, it's a clean bottle. They just want to make sure it's sterile. Well, they can use uh, uh, ultraviolet light or they can use an electron beam. An All electron right. beam dissipates, it, it, it's, it cleans it. It's a green method of cleaning. There's no waste. Wow. Well, so Bill, all sorts of uses for like we, we've gone we've gone over time. I got just so wrapped up in everything that all these possibilities, and you do it right here in our backyard. I just so glad you came today sure. to let folks know about, about yeah. what you do. Thank you so much. You bet.